Welcome to the Listen Up Podcast, where we explore hearing loss, communication, connections, and health. Hey, everybody. Dr. Mark Sims here. I'm the host of the Listen Up Podcast, where I feature top leaders in healthcare. This episode is brought to you by Listen Up Hearing Center. I help patients to effectively treat their hearing loss so that they can connect better with their friends and family and remain independent. The reason I'm so passionate about hearing loss is because I lost my brother, Robbie, twice. First to his hearing loss from radiation to his tumor, and then when he passed away. I only care for ears. I'm the E of year of ENT. I performed over 10,000 ear surgeries and taken care of many, many more with hearing loss. I'm the founder of Listen Up Hearing Centers, and I'm the author of a book of the same name, Listen Up, A Physician's Guide to Effectively Treating Your Hearing Loss. If you want to learn more about that, go to listenuphearing.com. That's listenuphearing.com. Today, I have a great guest. It's Thomas Powers, a PhD. He's got a doctorate in audiology. He's an expert audiology consultant and strategic advisor for the Hearing Industry Association. He received a PhD in audiology from Ohio University. He began his career as a partner in an audiology private practice and has over 35 years of experience in the hearing healthcare industry. He's published a lot, over 40 articles and 200 presentations on various audiology and healthcare topics, including technology and disruptive technologies. I'm really excited to have Tom on the on the show. Tom, thanks for coming. I appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast. Thanks a lot, Mark. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So, t- tell me a little bit about uh, you know your your pathway. Um, you know, I mean, I just kind of did your academic credentials, but you know, tell me a little bit about you know the things that you are and kind of where how you ended up where you are today. Yeah, I uh, you know I I started off just being a, a science biology major uh, at, at early on in my career at uh, SUNY Geneseo in upstate New York. Um, you know, sort of thought maybe I go into dentistry or medicine or some biology related thing. Um, you know, got got to organic chemistry and did did okay in the class. But but the the interesting part about that class was we had a little as many of us that took that class an experiment where you had to uh, you know go through a whole process and then you take your your results and and a syringe and, and put it in a in a spectrometer and uh, you know your grade was D C B A and I watched all these people ahead of me. You know, this is of course about the Vietnam War time, so. Uh, you know, not get good grades and head up down to the bar. Fortunately, mine went just over the B. And I thought, you know, I'm not sure I want to do this the rest of my career. <laughs> it sort of is a little strange. So I went back to the dorm and talked to some friends. And one of them happened to be a, a speech path major who ended up becoming the director of the department there at Tennessee. And so I looked in the, you know, looked in the school, you know, looked at all the courses, et cetera, and went up and talked to somebody in that department and changed my major and finished up speech, did two years in the public schools right after that. Um, you know, which was, which was really kind of an interesting time. I, uh, you know, I, I just found the public schools to be, you know, especially in speech, I guess, but in general, they're, they're sort of interesting, uh, but I didn't want to do that either the rest of my life. So I decided let's go to the other side of the, the business audiology, uh, ended up at Ohio university, um, uh, started just to get a master's and, and then stayed on to get a PhD and did my, my master's thesis in, in, uh, in speech processing with Sadan Singh, who was a fairly well-known guy started, uh, you know, here in, in, in academia, but, you know, ran three publishing companies, uh, finished up with John Shallop in electrophysiology, thought I was going to be with chinchillas the rest of my life, but ended up uh, taking another right turn and going into private practice and seeing like real patients, which was kind of a, another, another interesting part. Uh, and, and then from there, I ended up in the hearing aid industry, met some people in the industry and got an offer to come to work for Siemens and went there in 1981 and spent the rest of my career really working in the hearing aid industry in a variety of jobs from sales and marketing, product management, uh, compliance officer. Um, so, you know, then I retired, semi-retired a couple of years ago. Um, my dad was having some some health issues. It was good to have that last year or so. And uh, and now I just do consulting and I have a, a simple rule for my little company. If it's not fun and interesting, I don't do it. Fair enough. That sounds like a great rule. Yeah. Uh, everybody should live that way or have the ability to live that way, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, what I would say is, is you have a lot of experience in the hearing care industry, right? And so, you know, what are some of the challenges you see going on right now in the hearing care industry? Well, certainly, you know, the big buzzword, of course, is the OTC, uh, you know, legislation slash regulations with uh, with just started last month in October and seems to be just creating a lot, a lot of buzz. Um, 
both at the manufacturing level and at the uh, you know dispensing audiology retail level. Um, you know, I, I, I find it kind of interesting that it seems like this is all of a sudden, even though it's been coming for five years. Uh, yeah. And so I think, you know, people are wondering sort of what's going to happen. How do I deal with it? And, uh, you know, I guess my, my thought there is, you know, we've had a long time to think about it. It seems like we should be ready, um, but, it, but it doesn't seem quite that, that way, uh, but both, both for consumers as well. I think there's, there's an awful lot of uh, confusion out there. You know, I did a I did a webinar a week or so ago for, for the Hearing Loss Association of America. And, you know, and, and there's just a lot of questions about where do we go? How do I get it? How do I decide what's right? What do I need? Um, and so I, I think there's there's a great need for information out there for maybe for professionals, but but a lot but a lot for consumers to sort of ease them in, in terms of their thinking about the uh, you know, worrying about making the wrong decision, getting the device, and because they have it mandated, of course, in the regulation, the return privilege um, be mandatory. You know, trying to advise consumers that you know, be sure that you can return it if it doesn't work for you. I mean, last thing we want is a whole bunch of people out there unhappy with with devices that aren't working for them because it takes us long enough to get those people to see us, you, me, and, and everybody else in hearing healthcare, um, and, and we don't want to you know push them out even further by by not helping them get the, the right help that they need, whether it's a device or, or whatever it is that they need. Uh, you know, yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, I mean, I don't disagree that there's a decent amount of confusion associated with OTC. I guess my comment would be, I think there's a lot of confusion, period, meaning, uh, you know, it's brought uh, less clarity to an already murky uh, area in terms of hearing health. Um, you know, to me, that that's one of the net results in the in the immediate future, we'll see how, how it, it kind of pans itself out. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, you know, you we, we all thought that there'd be a lot more clarity, I guess, after the regulations were issued, and and it, it doesn't quite seem that way. There's uh, there's still a lot of, of concern about the out, you know, all the technical requirements and all that that was surrounding it, and, uh, and even still with some of the, the state now regulations, um, you know, what- The variability, what's yeah, it's going to be difficult. Now we got 50 states with 50 di different regulations, and that's great if you only, you know, practice in one. But as we see the, you know, the audiology speech path uh, consortium stuff starting to happen, and people may want to practice across state lines if you live close, like in Missouri and Illinois or someplace, um, you know, how, how do we all handle this? And so I, you're right, there's there's enough confusion to go around at, at a variety of levels here. And so, uh, well, how are people dealing with that issue? I mean, so I'm in Arizona, I'm in Phoenix. It's relatively in the center, so we don't, I mean, at least I'm not dealing in my immediate uh, care uh, catchment with those kind of cross-state issues. So how do people deal with that? Do they just get double licensure? Yeah, a lot of them uh, are uh, but now, uh, up, up till this point. I think as this, um, you know, this consortium that, that is moving to, to get the final regulations, I think the last count, I guess there's 18 or 20 states, maybe a few more. You know, in the audiology speech path um, consortium. So it's a like, consortium. Of con I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, is yeah. that a consortium of states that are trying to yeah. uh, make the um, uh, streamline the regulations? Yeah, like a compact. I mean, it's uh, very similar. You see it in other other professions. One of one of my daughters is an RN, so you know she she's uh, was a travel nurse for, for quite some time, and, and nursing has a an interstate compact. I should call it the compact as opposed to the consortium, but the interstate compact in nursing. And so, you know, she was able to, you know, a year or two out of school said, listen, you know, I don't have any things holding me down here, no boyfriend, no, you know, other than my parents, of course, but, but go ahead and, and go out and, and see the country. And so, you know, she could literally, um, you know, get, get screened through the company. Yeah, it's pretty portable. Out, yeah. And just go work just about anywhere else. It's probably 30 states, 35 states. I mean, she was in Arizona, California, back in Boston, Massachusetts for see her other sister down to Savannah, Georgia, back, you know. So it made it very easy um, because you're in that that sort of um, you know compact where in in audiology that doesn't well it's, it doesn't exist at this moment they're in the process of defining the rules so it would help those people that live uh, you know where you've got people crossing a you know a state line but up till now yes you would have to be licensed in both of those states or 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 more um, you know to be able to to practice I mean you know some of the telehealth stuff eased up a little bit with you know with COVID and so forth but. Um, there's there's still some 
some restrictions on on how much and what you should be doing across state lines, especially, you know, when it really isn't close. I look at living here in New Jersey in the Northeast, we have a lot of people that certainly go to Florida or Arizona or places in the wintertime. And, and that isn't like across just the state line. It's That's not. You're not going to New Jersey to Pennsylvania or to New York, right? Correct. Correct. And so, uh, so yeah. So I think that'll that'll help. But but again, we're we're still seeing uh, how is that all going to work? And, and now, one of the questions I have is for a lot of these new uh, online uh, direct to consumer. Used to be direct to consumer, but now as OTC companies who are going to provide support, yeah, if they're going to have audiologists in the support. Uh, they're going to have to get licensed in 20, 30, 40 states. And that's, that's, that's uh, not only time consuming to take all the tests and everything else, but, but expensive, I guess, for the company. But I suppose that's, that's part of the, part of the deal. Yeah. Medicine's that way. I mean, I need to be licensed in each state. Um, so, you know, and, and, you know, I I think people think, I mean, I I don't have a a feeling either way um, that it should be a good answer, but that type of licensure is a, a state, function, right? And so the federal government really doesn't have the ability, I believe, to supersede or override that. I mean, it's uh, if patients, if people want an analogy, um, medical versus recreational versus no marijuana is a perfect example that that's a state by state basis because it's a regulated on a state level. Correct. Correct. And it's the same, you know, the same in, in this area here. You have people who, who should be licensed in the state where they re- provide service or where the patient is, for example. Right. Uh, you know, and, and you're right. It's um, it's uh, it becomes it becomes important because you want to make sure that providers uh, are competent to provide those services. And that's that's the way the state regulates that the federal can't, government can't preempt that as the saying goes. You know? Is there a universality about uh, what the scope of practice is too? I mean, that would be one of the issues too. I would, I think some states have a very, uh, the, the, what they can and can't do is highly specific in statute. Um, some it's not specific and it's very general. Um, so it yeah, might you be an that, issue. it's probably more aligned uh, within, within the audiology part. I mean, this, this compact is audiology and speech, so they'll write rules for each, each portion. Uh, but it's more aligned there than, let's say, for hearing aid specialists or hearing aid dispensers, which are not part of this compact. That's a totally, right. different, totally different group. Uh, but there you, you do see differences. I mean, some states you can see and, and help slash treat patients with tinnitus. Other states, dispensers can't do that. Um, most anywhere, of course, uh, states regulate, you know, with children should see an audiologist and a physician as opposed to just seeing a specialist. So. So yeah, there there are distinct scope of practice issues that come into play, but there's not a not a ton of difference, I would guess, in the states. There's part of my minor differences that I've seen, but they don't. Uh, it isn't that you can and can't do balance testing, for example. I mean, most audiologists are are capable within scope of practice. Whether you're trained to do it, that's that could be be another question. Uh, well, I mean, I think you know that's an interesting. I mean, the antithesis of that, which is uh, I'm I don't have clarity. Maybe you do. Uh, is the difference between what the license allows you to do and what you need a license to do. Correct. Which are Correct. different. Like, so I'm not sure you actually need a license to perform balance testing. No, no, exactly. Exactly. But, you know, it's certainly within the scope of practice for audiologists to do it. For an audiologist. And, yeah. And then, well, I mean, they have a very broad scope of practice. It's just what is uniquely right. And so they actually, and I think that's where some, I mean, just my opinion, but it seems like some legislatures have stayed very vague because they don't want to get into the scope of practice issues because it changes. Absolutely. I mean, you think about what uh, audiologists did or didn't do. I mean, when I started in practice uh, in 1977, you know, the ASHA, which was the only regulatory entity, if you will, association, not regulatory, I guess, but the only right. professional association. Professional organization, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you couldn't fit hearing aids and make a profit on the device. It was unethical. And then uh, there was a change in 1978 based on a, Fed, a Supreme Court ruling with architects where they could bid on a project and then be involved in the construction, which is sort of analogous to doing the testing and, and fitting the hearing aid. And so, uh, you know, we had to be totally unbundled in those days. Every single thing had a line item, you know, the hearing test evaluation, the cost of the device, the dispensing fee. Now it's all bundled, you know, for years. And now today we're talking about unbundling again and so uh, the clock is uh, uh, the pendulum sort of swings back because um you know both otc as well as insurance and, and a lot of other factors 
are, are looking at what what's in that bundle price and and how do we and not only give transparency to consumers but also how is that just going to work as as we move forward here? So I think uh, you know we'll see a a move toward a bundling, which is a whole other topic. But but yeah, it, it comes back to the to the scope and and how you deal with with patients and billing and insurance and and all that stuff. Yeah. No, no, I think it's a challenging thing. I think it's interesting because um, if people looked at other unbundled things like building a home, um, uh, they'd be surprised how much of that's actually labor. And yeah. uh, I think that that's actually one of the things that has been underappreciated is in that bundle price, how much of it actually is labor, meaning physical labor, intellectual labor, all of that. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how that gets valued, because to me, the device is the least of the cost. It's it's the, the expertise of the person who's uh, fitting you and making sure you're treated well. Correct. Correct. And I think, you know, it's it's been difficult because... For a long time, we just looked at the, the device, you know, and it's sort of in the ads in between your fingers there. And that's the cost. And, and it didn't really break out the professional uh, expertise, services, et cetera. And so consumers sort of began to, to believe, based on that, that theme, that everything was in the cost of the device. And there must be something that they get, but I'm not quite sure what that is. And so th- then it becomes difficult to assign value, which, which I think is a good point. You know, how do you assign value to those services when you sort of thought they were free because it was associated with the product, which really it isn't. So, well, so bit- I think our language gives us away because what do we tell people with hearing losses to do? Yeah, exactly. they'll, they'll get hearing aids, right? Okay. Exactly. And so that has no consideration of the uh, professional component. Correct. So, you know, um, that, that in and of itself, the language that we use uh, kind of betrays the value proposition. So that those are things that need to change uh, yeah. to really get people to be valued for their skills. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, uh, you know, maybe maybe OTC can help this by, you know, again, forcing some of this to look at the device separately from the professional services component to it, whether it's a, a simple, I don't want to say simple OTC that oversimplicate by it, but if you can go get it on your own and what you're looking for is just some help on, on how does it work? How do I get it in my ear? Where do I sit when I go to dinner? How do I handle those things? And that's a one or two half hour, hour session, as opposed to, you know, I have a significant loss. Eligibility is 50%. I need lots of help and explaining how this all works. You know, then, then there's a lot more professional involvement there. And, and, uh, and that's going to be more expensive. And so maybe that's more in tune with with what the professional side is, because you're right, then the device is the device to some degree and services that come along for it are are, uh, are probably more important in that second example. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think, you know, that's my personal feeling that the services are much more important than the device. And I think that's actually some of the tension between the profession and the manufacturers, right? I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think you know everybody's trying to to, to maybe point, point in, in different directions as to where the costs are, and uh, you know, it's. I think it's at some point it just has to be here. Here's what it is, and and let's all move forward with with knowing which piece and who owns which piece uh, in a sense of, of that total cost, uh, which, which again was a lot easier back in in my early days because well, it's it's much more confusing now, right? Because uh, industry owns practices. So they're involved in the professional service providing. So where that kind of reach of industry ends is is uh, pretty murky these days. It's a gray, much gray, much gray line there. Uh, yeah, you're right. They own practices. I mean, we see now they also have uh, companies that are involved in managed care. So that, that reach goes in the in the other direction as well, and which then uh, you know further clouds the issue, if you will, from a from from a transparency standpoint. I mean, I think everybody's trying to do the what they do for their business in a in an ethical way. I don't think anybody's doing anything, I hope, illegal. No, um, it's just tension between interests. I, yeah. I don't think it's not ethical. I just think there are divergent interests and people are trying to figure out whose interests get represented or whose interests get heard the loudest or or the like. I mean, you yeah. know. Exactly. Um, it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, so, it's, there's not a clear line defining who's responsible for what, in a sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that ultimately, this might sound strange, but that's up to the consumer to decide. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think they, they need to ask, ask the questions, which is why, you know, this, this 
you know, how, how does this new delivery system work? Um, you know, to try and help them navigate that is 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 a I think a thing that we need to try and give them enough information so they can make informed decisions about uh, about those things we just talked about. You know, well, but they already know, right? Because you can go to Home Depot and you can buy cans of paint yep. and you can put them on your wall, yeah. or you can hire a painter and have the painter put it on your wall. Yep. And so they already know where the costs lie, right? The difference between the paint or the paint applied. Correct. Right. And so, yeah. I mean, uh, there are many examples of life where we know the difference between unbundling the do it yourself versus bundled yeah. total yeah. cost of service. Right. Right. So. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll see. Uh, I, I hope uh, I hope some of this, uh, you know, tension goes away. It's, I don't think it's, it's good overall for the whole community, I guess. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure the tension is going to go away till there's there's a shakeout, right? I mean, I think basically, um, you know, I could be wrong, but I think it's musical chairs, and there are less chairs than there are people, and people are wondering who's going to be left Sitting without. The yeah, the chairs. Sitting in the chairs when the music stops, right? Yeah. 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 So, so, I mean, you know, uh, uh, really uh, kind of a bigger reach, but so you know, break out your crystal ball. I'm sure they gave you one in your PhD program. Right. Uh, and uh, wh where do you see it five years from now? If you could take a swing, like how is, I mean, it's great to say that, but, you know, I would lean on your 35 years of experience. So wh where do you see five years from now? How has it shaken out? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think one of the interesting beginnings of how it might shake out is is these recent uh, you know, collaborations with uh, in industry players and consumer brands. And, you know, I look at, you know, my former employer, Siemens, which became Savantos Insignia, WS, now partnering with Sony. And, you know, the others all have, you know, Sonos with uh, Sennheiser, et cetera. I mean, there's a whole bunch that pick on one versus the other. But, but you know, does that signal that, that this whole sort of, uh, I don't want to say the whole industry, but, but a great much of it moves more toward a consumer uh, electronic standpoint, if you will, or, or you know, market um then then a a medical audiology hearing aid sort of thing are these all going to be sort of earbuds that so you know down the road and maybe a much smaller prescription as the you know the regulations call um a class of devices uh because i i also see not only if i look at the whole market here the OTC is coming, if you want to say, from the bottom up, stripping it, looking at it from a pricing standpoint, from the bottom up in, in that area. Um, from the top down, we have cochlear implants, uh, who, who those regulations continue to evolve and, and more and more patients become eligible. It's, it's right. utilized, uh, very unutilized. We know we know that. Um, for so right. hearing aids, by the way. For, pardon? Yeah, well, Sorry. of course. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, a, it's going to be interesting to see if, if those two market forces squeeze what's what's into the middle um, for the existing big five, as they will call them, um, is there is there enough room for for the big five there? I think there could be, um, but we need to get all of those people uh, who aren't using devices today and or you know implants um, into the market so that uh, so that more of the, so there's more. The, the pie is bigger and everybody. Keeps ah, so I, yeah. So you're, you're talking about from a industry point of view Correct. that the number of potential patients is getting squeezed from the bottom and the top. And so how many are left for them to uh, actually get their hearing aids in their ears is going down. Yeah. That's a fascinating. Right. Yeah. It could, could be. I mean, I think, you know, if, uh, if they all play and, and are successful in, in the OTC part. I mean, you know, we don't have, we only have Sonova playing in, in the implant side right now because, you know, DeMont and Oticon got out of there. They sold, sold it to Cochlear. So, we so, are still selling, but yes. We're still, yeah, right. <laughs> um, but the industry, uh, those things take a long time. Let's just yes, that way. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, it moves. Uh, you know, the press release is one thing, but what happens afterwards? Um, sure. But yeah, so I, I think, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, potential for for those kind of things to get to get squeezed from from either side however if if they're successful helping consumers come into this new otc space um you know if we look at the 40 to 50 million depending on whose number you believe in the united states um you know with uh, on average you know 10 12 million people wearing hearing aids and we sell 4 million a year 
that's you know that's units. So two million, if you say most of them are binaural, it's one point eight. But let's you know for math purposes, two million new users every year, five year average life. It's you know you can sort of do the whole bunch of math, but you know we're only getting 25, 30 percent of the people in. If if we had a lot more of them, there'd be a lot more room for for those players to to, to play in that pool of of potential uh, people to wear hearing aids. So. You know, I, I think it's going to be interesting on the on the retail side. I mean, retail meaning professional audiology side. Um, it, I could I could see a, a very different um, landscape there, where we have potentially concierge audiology, like we have concierge physician, where they're handling high end devices, people with unique and and different hearing loss that configurations. Um, you know, and and you know, really really tough needs in terms of their listening environments. And then potentially at the other end, you know, we're going to have the existing OTC, you know, mall locations that are that are just going to be staffed by or the best buys and Walgreens, et cetera, that, that's truly retail. Um, which again goes back to the same sort of analogy with the manufacturer. If you've got sort of a high end and a low end and what's sort of left in the middle is is to me a little bit where the that's unclear as to who's going to win and who's going to survive there. Well, I mean, I guess the challenge to the providers is, is if you offer a similar experience to what the OTC will deliver, yet you're, you know, four, six, eight, ten x that cost, it's going to be a tough. That's a tough go. I yeah, think is yeah, is yeah. the real answer. And so, yeah, exactly. um, yeah. now, it'll be interesting yeah. to see. I mean, I think the one thing that's a tough dialogue is, is, is as you know, there's places in Europe where hearing aids are free. Yeah. And um, uh, the market penetration is not substantially greater uh, than the United States, which I think means maybe we don't know the total root cause of why people don't pursue hearing loss, although the goal of OTCs is to say that it's cost. Yeah. And so it'll be interesting to see. Yeah, exactly. I just uh, We were just there giving a talk at the European uh, at the meeting, and, and that was a, a big part of discussion among some of the people I've known there for years is, you know, is this this is going to move the needle? Sort of was the question, um, and I don't I, you know I don't know that yet. So, but you're right. It, there's uh, you know maybe a little bit higher penetration if you look at some of their data. couple of percentage points though. It's nothing like it's you not would, huge. No, you're talking yeah, nothing like you're going to say. Wow, that that is the linchpin or the keystone to this issue. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, so so yeah, it goes beyond cost. I mean, we've got stigma, we've got all kinds of issues there. Form factors, people don't want to use them, makes them look old. You know, there's you can the list goes on and on. Right. Uh, so it's not it's not just just the cost. And when they're free, everybody, you know, we'd all like to have lines outside our door when we open up, say, fit me first. But that doesn't happen even over there. So, yeah. So I think it's a, it's a lot more than uh, a lot more things going on that we, we probably don't understand. I think the stigma issue is, is a big one. We had a lady who came to a, a focus group one time. We asked her, you know, the moderator said, how do you feel Then you've been diagnosed with hearing loss and they went around the room and everybody was supposed to bring a picture of how they felt and people had sad faces and crying and when she turned her picture over she showed a picture of a casket wow. which was which was pretty profound I, I was behind the glass you know watching and and I I mean that it sort of stuck with me <laughs> and I you realize for some people that, that this is a pretty traumatic uh, event right. and maybe you know i mean for for this person a, as much as as the cancer work you know i mean I, I it was it was it was pretty profound to have her sit there and say this is this is how i feel so so yeah there's a lot more going on not to, not to dwell well, on. I, that, that would it. tie back to my comment about confusion yeah exactly right? and so that 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 to me represents a a very significant symbol of her confusion so yeah, yeah. this is great and it'll be interesting to see and revisit with you at some uh, time point and see, you know, uh, yeah. where 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 things have end up relative uh, to, you know, what you're saying. I mean, I know that people are watching on a day to day basis are know that the regulations, but you know, it'll be interesting to see how that how long that takes for it to, you know, impact mainstream Main Street America, right? And to really yeah. get out of uh, the meeting rooms and the corporate meeting rooms and the chatterbox and get out to really when does it have an impact in the real you know in the day-to-day -day operations yeah absolutely i mean today it's a you know it's a headline a day about otcs you know we all get our alerts in our mailbox and uh, it seems like every day there's a new newspaper or, or some you know local news organization doing something about otc because it's 
and it's just interesting and, and different than than uh, bad news about you know, things going on in their community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I just but I think the news right. represents the ambiguity, right? Yeah, there's absolutely. a lack of clarity for the news, right? It's not like because you know if it were clear, they'd run the story and it'd be done. Exactly, you need one, and you know here it is, and everybody go, go for it, and it, right. it, it's not what's happening. Well, Tom, um, I, I always ask, what's your favorite sound? My, I guess my favorite sound is is really listening to uh, to grandkids. You know, I, I love listening. That when I hear that sound, that they walk in the door. Um, you know, my own kids certainly when they were small, but but I, I think that to me is um, is just something that uh, you, you just never get tired of listening to. You know, sure, sure. when they were here during COVID. Um, you know, my come of my grandkids were here because my nurse, I mentioned, you know, my girl, my, my daughter's a nurse. She was working at, you know, a lot of COVID. And, and so they come here for their, their, their school, you know, and they get logged in. And, and in the morning, uh, I, one morning I came upstairs to her little desk that we set up for her. And I said, are you logged in? Are you ready to go? The IT guy is here thinking, you know, and, and she looked up at me, the 10 year old looked up at me and said, you know, grandpa, you're much more than the IT guy to me. And, and that's boy, that's something for a 10 year old to think up. Yeah, so, that was nice. That was great. Yeah. Really so, great. you know, when you hear those kids think up those kinds of things and just, uh, you know, and, and they're the old out of mouth of babes, you know, that sometimes yeah. you, you really uh, it's it's just a cool thing to, to listen to them because sometimes sometimes they know a lot more than we think. And, <laughs> they right. And they, so, and they don't have all the biases and the filters. Right. Absolutely. 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 So everybody, this this is uh, Thomas Power, Dr. Thomas Powers. He's a Ph.D., but he's a consultant in the audiology space. Uh, Tom, if, if people wanted to get a hold of you or talk to you, h- how would they find you? Yeah, uh, my, my email address is, uh, you know, Dr. D-R-T-O-M-P-O-W-B-R-S, Dr. Tom Powers at Comcast.net. That's the easiest way to shoot me an email. And I'm happy to, uh, you know, respond and answer questions and, uh, you know, give you my opinions. They're almost, almost always for free. <laughs> so. That's great. Well, again, uh, thank you so much. Uh, this has been a really great conversation of kind of the state of the industry in a particular inflection point. I uh, really appreciate your uh, your experience and your insights and your contribution to the field. And thanks for coming on. Thanks, Mark, for having me. I appreciate nice. it. Great it's conversation. Great. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to the Listen Up podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get updates on future episodes.